So it is my honor to present our keynote speaker today. Um, let me tell you how I met Linda Holmes. I got to South by Southwest and got in a cab, and I got a text from my friend Kevin saying, hey, would you like to meet Linda Holmes? And I said, would I? Um, in the text with like, would I font. Um, and uh, reason being, for the past two years, I'd already become a huge fan of the podcast Pop Culture Happy Hour, which I, yes. <laughs> which I, uh, I highly recommend you seek out and geek out on. Um, uh, she also does an amazing uh, blog called NPR Monkey C, which is a pop culture blog. Um, and uh, we ended up having a very nice breakfast while at South By, which, getting on topics of the future of content, ended up inspiring one of the talks I'll be giving later today. So, uh, generator of great ideas, wonderful uh, pod, uh, podcast host, um, and not to mention writer of a website um, that I didn't even know she wrote for back when I was reading it. This was Television Without Pity. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Yes, right? So uh, she was a writer. No way! <laughs> I know, right? Um, so, so without any further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, in to introduce Linda Holmes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That's like the best thing that ever happens. That is the best thing that ever happens, obviously. Um, so James Leo Walsh was a professor that I had in college from whom I took criminology. He was also a prosecutor. Uh, he wore a tuxedo on the first day of class. Class is important. Sociology professors send signals, wore a tuxedo to class. One of the reasons why I loved him is that he used to introduce into grand philosophizing by college students a question that I loved. For example, he gave a hypothetical once. He said, and again, this is criminology. He gave a hypothetical. He said, imagine a driver who has been living in a country where they drive on the left side of the road. They come to the United States where we drive on the right side of the road. And this driver, she's a nice person. She's a good lady. She's a careful driver. She's not drunk. She makes a turn. She has a terrible moment. The brain goes crosswise. She goes into the wrong lane. She hits somebody's head on and somebody dies. How do you want to handle this hypothetical under the criminal law? And the students in the class, you know, you get somebody who would say, well, you know, the purposes of the criminal justice system are incarceration and rehabilitation and retribution and deterrence. So according to that, I would handle it this way. Can't really rehabilitate her. She has nothing wrong with her. They would work through it that way. And somebody else would say, well, you know, the truth of the matter is she still hurts someone. People have to be responsible for their actions. That's the rule. So as sad as it is, I would send her to jail for a long time. And Walsh would stop and he would say, what kind of world do you want to live in? Now you would think that this would not be a shocking question. Because not only were these college students, these were Oberlin college students. So thinking about what kind of world you want to live in is probably the most popular pastime on campus after like the bike derby, derby and the drag ball, right? <laughs> it's kind of their thing. But somehow, when you got into little specifics, that question of what kind of world you want to live in would kind of fall out. And when it would get brought up, people would think, oh, well, I don't know that you gain a lot from putting this lady in jail at all. So I've always really loved that question, and I come back to it all the time, no matter what I'm talking about. I come back to it with work, I come back to it with friends, I come back to it with everything. And it's particularly useful to me in situations where I have a lot of questions and where I don't really know what's going on. The future of content, right? When I originally talked to Dave about talking to you, I then went to a friend and I said, so I'm talking about the future of content and I'm assuming that I'm not just supposed to say LOL and then the shruggy emoji. <laughs> because a couple weeks ago, I actually was having a conversation with some friends in which I said, what am I going to do if writing is obsolete? <laughs> Uh, which is sort of a joke because I don't actually believe that reading things which human beings have been doing for thousands of years is something that's going to end in my lifetime and you'll be able to tell from what happens to my career or the careers of my friends. But this is something that is causing, I think, a lot of existential anxiety 
for people who make content and people who do writing, particularly for me, maybe. So what I want to talk about a little bit today is first, some of the questions that I have and some of the things that I'm kind of trying to pour over in my own head. And then a little bit about some of the things that I'm trying to do because of the kind of world that I want to live in. So that's where I'm starting. First, a little bit of an introduction to the stuff that I make so that you know kind of what my, what my basis for all this is. Um, at NPR, I primarily make two things. It's kind of getting into three things, but I will explain that. Prior to that, I did, I was at Television Without Pity, writing recaps back when that was something that would be like a 17 page thing that took five days to write, the olden days. Uh, I also wrote a little bit for TV Guide, the days of $2 a word. <sighs> ah, print, right? Um, and before, and I also uh, used to be an attorney. So 10 years ago today, I was handling appellate cases for the state of Minnesota and also recapping uh, The Amazing Race and Survivor and stuff like that. <laughs> so, and actually on one occasion, I actually flew from Minnesota to Vegas for an Amazing Race premiere party, flew back that night on the red eye and went into court the next morning. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> of all the things. So, uh, so my life has not only gotten weird recently, but that's, um, so that's what I was doing originally. At NPR, I came to NPR in 2008 to be the founding editor and writer of their pop culture blog, Monkey See, which I did not name, by the way. Um, and there I write about television, I review movies. I just got back from the Toronto Film Festival where I got to see a bunch of stuff, uh, ask me about Oscar movies. Um, and I wrote recently a, a, an 11-part 11 11 series on the state of television in 2015. Um, and I think that 11-part series on the state of television all put together got about one-fourth of the traffic of a post that I wrote in January that I spent about 20 minutes on about my favorite parts of the trailer of the Jennifer Lopez movie, The Boy Next Door. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I also host Pop Culture Happy Hour, which we started in 2010. I started with my, my best friend, Stephen Thompson, who's a writer with NPR Music. Stephen and I wanted to do a panel show that really put the focus on the conversation. He had done a lot of All Songs Considered roundtable discussions. That's one of NPR's music shows. And he would do those with the hosts of All Songs and with Carrie Brownstein, who uh, is now more famous somewhat for being on uh, Portlandia and, of course, from being in the band Slater Kenny, but who also used to have a terrific music blog at NPR. So we wanted to do a panel show. and. Um, so we put it together kind of without telling anyone, a little bit. It was a different time in podcasting at NPR. And uh, so we rounded up a young producer who we liked, who we thought was great, who we thought might want to do a fun project. And we said, hey, Mike, you want to come in the studio in this little prod room? It was our old building, little somewhat dumpy little prod room. Come in there and tape with us. And we went to our bosses and we, we did this. We sort of did the... Um, we're going to go do an experiment in the prod room and then we're going to post it on the blog and maybe we'll ever do it again and maybe we'll never do it again and thanks so bye anyway because <laughs> we didn't we thought they'd say no so we did it that way and uh we've been doing that ever since we actually have uh we tape in one of the studios now we're we're all grown up in that sense um and now, the third thing that I sort of do is, is something that a lot of people who work in content are moving into, which is a, a certain amount of live stuff. We do live shows sometimes, and I, and I do interviews with people uh, in front of audiences. So this is the stuff that kind of I'm doing. So that's where my, kind of my thinking about all of this is coming from. So my first question uh, that I'm kind of working through myself, I have this theory about culture and habit and enthusiasm which is that a lot of the biggest forms of American media have been built for a long time on habit, building habit in people who read or watch or listen. And more and more, you're moving into a culture that places a greater value on enthusiasm than on habit. If all, because all you really had to do, think about broadcast television, right? All you really had to do in broadcast television was build a habit in people to watch a show and they would be counted and if you've read like the power of habit or any of that research habits once established are pretty self-perpetuating it lowers the value of quality control it lowers the value of lots of things because all the person has to do is show up and in fact 
any effort that you put into converting that person from somebody who in the old model would sit down at eight o'clock when a show is on and pick your show over originally the other two or three shows that might be on, any effort that you put into making that show so good that people will love and adore it and be deeply attached to it is kind of, from a business perspective, wasted money because that person is not worth any more to you. That's kind of what broadcast is, in a way, right? Um, if you compare that to a model like HBO, one of the HBO doesn't necessarily make better content because they have smarter people or because they're more high cultured. They're the brilliant people working in broadcast TV. It's just the incentives are different, right? At HBO, if you like Game of Thrones enough that if you already have HBO and it's on, you'll watch it, that's worth something to them, right? Adds to the value of your HBO subscription in your own mind. But if you love it so much that you will pay for HBO just to have it, that show is more valuable. There is value to building deep, deep, enthusiastic attachments to things. And I think that that move away from habit is happening in other places too. It's happening, it's happening to some degree in radio. Um, you know, the habit of turning on the radio in the car is, is an evolving kind of thing. It's still very much part of lots of people's lives. But as you move into podcasting, one of the things that that does, despite the fact that you have a subscription, um, how many of you download more podcasts than you actually listen to? Me too. So you still have to get that extra step of the person going and picking it, even if they subscribe. They have to go and pick that thing out of all the things they could do. You need an attachment to that thing in order for it to be valuable. And that's not really a cre that's not necessarily a creative difference, but it's an economic difference that I think can drive a creative difference. So what you have to what, what I'm trying to work through is how do you sort of monetize enthusiasm, as gross as that sounds, without breaking it, right? Because enthusiasm is a really, really delicate thing. And when you experience it, it's like it's this thing that you sort of have to be very careful with because people get very attached. And that's a good thing because they'll give you money and they'll pay for things and they'll, they'll evangelize for your project. But it's a, you have to treat it carefully, right? So if you look at something like podcasts, podcasts, you know, it still matters how many people download a podcast. It's, a, it's, it's still a numbers, um, it's still a numbers thing. I tend to know exactly what our download numbers look like because I am a petty, tiny, competitive person. Um, <laughs> So I typically know that. But what podcast advertisers talk about a lot of the time is that they like the, the intimacy of audio and the closeness that people feel with podcast hosts. They're essentially monetizing how much people trust you, which is very complicated <laughs> as a thing to think about because you have to be really careful how you use that. So trying to figure out how to get people who are enthusiasts and fans of things, how to get that love to support projects so that they can thrive without giant audiences, without making those people feel like you're taking advantage of them or like you don't respect them or like you're, you're breaking the exact trust that they have with you, is a complicated and, and tricky thing. So that's one thing. Another thing is, and this goes back to the way that we created the podcast, another thing is how do you replace the useful qualities about bureaucracies when you stop relying on them? On institutional processes, right? We made our show outside of most of the institutional processes that have been built over the, what do I want to say, almost 50 year history of NPR. And Probably, I don't know of a way that we could have made it inside of those processes because we needed time to develop it and because it was new and because we just didn't. And there are ways in which I'm really proud of that and I'm really happy about that. And when we tell that story, you'll get people who will say, that sounds great. I want to do it exactly like that. I want to do everything under the radar, whatever. But there are there are useful things that institutional processes do that if you're going to be this way, if you're going to be, if you're going to try to be limber and entrepreneurial, you have to figure out what am I going to put in that's going to take the place of those processes. And I'll give you an example that's, that is not super easy for me to talk about, but it's absolutely true, which is had we gone through an institutional process at NPR, the original lineup of our show would not have been four white people of similar age. That's just, they just would not have allowed us to do that. And it was very difficult because at the time, like I said, it was kind of a side hustle. It was something that we were doing kind of 
for in our own time and we were asking essentially people for favors and i don't think we're alone in the fact that when you do those side hustle projects and when you do those improvisational entrepreneurial projects you rely very heavily on the networks of people that you know and that means that the shortcomings that exist in a lot of people's social networks in terms of the variety of people that you know personally are ported over into your work and when i think about what like how could that have gone differently right i don't know that we could have done the show that way where it could have been kind of cast by the company in terms of like here's the lineup that we want the way that they would pick lineups for for a project that they were investing a, a lot of money in because it was a project that was totally untested i don't know that it could have been done that way but what could have happened is i could have known a better broader circle of people and been working with a better and broader circle of people at the at the outset of that project and that would probably have been the best way to reflect a broader variety of voices on the show so if you're going to move in that kind of entrepreneurial way you have to figure out how the day to day before you even start that project is going to affect the way the project turns out so what we have done since then it's it's we've improved substantially upon that since then but you have to still work at it right we go out and we try to proactively meet new people and there are new you know we put new people on the show we encourage them to have their own projects and we encourage them in developing their own projects because a show that Steven and I started is always going to be Steven and my show and it's never going to be as valuable to the network in terms of a variety of voices as something that's started by other people to be their show so that's the most important thing we do but that is an example of where an institutional eye would have said you can't do it this way and we didn't have that institutional eye so we wound up having to figure out how to do that and it and it was it has been complicated and it is something that in a lot of ways i i i love the people i do the show with but it's complicated and it was it has been a drawback of the way we did it another thing would be resources right it's great to be under the radar under the radar sounds awesome except that unless you want to do it for nothing for the rest of your life you eventually have to figure out how you get on the radar <laughs> and you have to figure out how to make being under the radar not fall disproportionately on some people as opposed to others because Steven and I were writers we were not audio people we were not audio producers so when we went to somebody and said can you do this like just kind of as a an additional project we didn't know how long it was going to take we didn't know how much time we were asking for because we didn't know so we said the same way that we were going to do it and you know other people were going to do it oh said the producer can you do this well it takes a lot longer to produce a chat show that you cut from 60 minutes of tape down to 43 or 4 than it does to participate in it but we were we didn't know enough so an institutional process would have made sure that our producer got paid and and that's again that's not I'm not I'm not super happy about that we have it resolved now but it took a lot of it took a lot of work and it took a lot of you know it took a lot of catching up so i think if you're going to do things that are in that way kind of pop up projects you got to think about cuz i think this will happen with podcasts more and more where people who don't come out of radio world and podcast world and audio world will make podcasts and they may have more pull than whatever young producer they're working with so you have to advocate for that person it's incredibly important that whoever is is heading that up if there's not going to be an institutional person who says hey you know what you got to make sure that this is like an official project and it's in the budget and so forth you got to look out for that person and you have to put a limit on how long you're going to let that be in under the radar project cuz sometimes it falls disproportionately another thing for me is differentiating between habits and standards and i think when <laughs> traditional media companies and people who come out of traditional media companies are are trying to respond to this rapidly changing environment you have a lot of questions that are ultimately about if i change my approach to this am i lowering my standards and sometimes 
what seems like a standard in the way you operate in making content is actually a habit that doesn't require a lowering of standards to break. I'll give an example of what I'm talking about. If you have a book review operation and you say, generally, we have high standards, and imagine yourself saying this like maybe 15 years ago. We don't really review uh, um, self-published books. That's, that's not the kind of thing. We just kind of don't really do that. That was a very, I think, a very common you know, practice in a lot of places that reviewed books. Because self-publishing meant a particular thing then. It means a somewhat different thing now. And if you go to people and say, I would like to, to uh, get into reviewing self-published books, there are people who are going to say, that's lowering our standards. That's, we, 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 apply a kind of a, we apply a kind of a test to whether a book is fully vetted or whatever. The point is only that being a self-published book means a significantly different thing than it would have meant 15 or 20 years ago, I believe. And so... It's perfectly fine if you want to decide that you do have a standard that you don't review self-published books, but if you haven't thought about it in 20 years, it's just a habit. And you've got to think about whether it really is a standard. And from the flip side, I think there are people who come in new to media organizations and to, pe to places where people make content and feel like everything here is really stodgy. They have a lot of rules. They have a lot of rules. They just don't want to shake things up. And sometimes that's true. But sometimes it's true that those are actually standards and you don't want to change them. And even though they're frustrating and irritating, you don't actually want to change them because they actually are useful. If you have a standard, for example, for the way that your content generation works with sponsors or advertisers, and the world is kind of changing and sponsors are wanting different kinds of things, it's perfectly OK to say, I think we should explore different kinds of sponsorship experiences, different kinds of advertising. But you have to think through, that's a substantive change. That's not just a bunch of stodgy old people who don't want to have the relationships that will make you money. They, they may very well be doing that for a reason. So you can't assume just because something is a habit doesn't mean it's also not a standard. So making those distinctions to me becomes really important um, to make sure both that new things are being heard and that existing practices are being respected. There's a bunch of other stuff going on too, right? What, how does the interplay between devices and content affect the kind of content that's going to be made? I happen to be a person who owns this watch. Mine's an Android. I'm not an Apple person. <laughs> but, um, but it's amazing how, even as somebody who has always been an, an early adopter of various kinds of things, all of a sudden, it's not so much that it changes how you interact with, with content, it's just that you start thinking about what, it, what that might mean 10 years from now. And when I stand here and I say, I'm worried that writing is obsolete, part of what drives that is, this is not good for reading. My phone is not great for reading things that are long. And I honestly think that's part of why you will, if I may get up on a hobby horse, that's part of the reason why you will see things hashtagged on Twitter, long reads, that are seven paragraphs. <laughs> Don't do that. Because people are reading in different ways. I think there are also a lot of questions about how podcasts are going to be taken in. You'll hear people argue that the entire way that people process podcasts is, is broken, is too difficult, it's too hard. I don't have that experience. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that I understand that experience. But there are definitely people who feel that it's very difficult to get to podcasts. I don't know how much easier you can necessarily make it than it already is, because I think primarily it's, it's like anything else. You've got to figure out, you've got to learn how to do it once. Right? But it is true that a lot of people, particularly in Android world, people get them in all different ways. And every app works differently. And if you release a podcast and then you change it and you have to redo the feed, you'll have one app where people will say, I'm using XYZ app and it can't deal with this and I can't get the show. And it's not your app. But you still have to deal with it because you've got to get your show to people who want to listen to it. So there's a bunch of that stuff that's going on. 
So those are a bunch of my questions. Now, what kind of world do I want to live in? Right? I personally want, and these are, none of these are things that I consider myself to be a completed work with regard to these things. These are all things I'm trying to learn to do. These are all things that I'm trying to encourage other people to do as I try to focus on them myself. One of them is to treat everybody's work as if it has value. And my experience of being in kind of blogging world early on was that there was a lot of attention given to let's make sure that we properly credit aggregators. So that if you were going to pass on something that you found through Gawker or Metafilter or whatever, that you had to make sure you said, oh, okay, here's, my, here's my hat tip, here's my via, right? That we talked about a lot. But what happens now is that at what used to be kind of aggregator sites, and Metafilter is still like this, but what used to be kind of aggregator sites where they would really just be there to direct you to the original story and maybe give you just a little taste to direct you to the original story. Now what you get is essentially a write-through where they basically give you everything that you need to know. And there's no reason why you would go past that Gawker story back to the, for example, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because Gawker's the only place that does this. NPR does this sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with it inherently. They give you everything. They, they don't necessarily expect you to have to go all the way back to, for example, the, home, the, uh, the hometown paper where this was originally reported. And I don't necessarily have a problem with doing that. You can gather stuff together. I don't have a problem with that. Where I think we can improve and where I personally am trying to do better is in if I'm going to share that thing, I'm going to try very hard to share the hometown paper story and not the right through. Because ad-supported internet world is very shaky. Right? That's why we're having all these conversations about ad blocking. That's why we're having all these conversations about all this stuff. And we still live in an internet world that's more like broadcast television where everything is monetized through number of page views. And I don't necessarily think that that's ideal, but it's the way that things work right now. So if you're going to give, if you're going to share something, that's the closest you're probably really going to come to compensating the people who made the thing that you're sharing. So I am trying to focus on looking to who did the work? Where does the work live? Where does the reporting live? And if you're doing a right, if you're doing essentially a right through, but you're adding analysis and context, and what you're trying to share is that analysis and context, that's, that's a totally different question. But if it's legitimately just, here's a story that was reported here, and there's a little link at the bottom, follow the link at the bottom and share that, right? Because, <clears throat> There are two ways for me to feel about the, that Jennifer Lopez thing, right? Getting massively more traffic than something that I spent literally weeks working on. And one way is, is of course, despair. That's A. Why write anything? Why am I even here? Why did I pick this job? Why did I pick this career? But the other way is to say, why am I assuming that my measure of success is to have something chortled at passively by the largest possible number of people? <laughs> That's an economic imperative. That is not a creative imperative. So hopefully, there is a time down the line where that enthusiasm that people might have for a deep dive into the current state of television can make money. But even when it doesn't, you've got to still do it. But meanwhile, somebody's looking at how much traffic stuff gets. So if you're sharing and you want to give people's work value, try to share the original thing as much as possible. Because that's the world that I personally want to live in. Have and support the ethic of kicking a buck, which is something that I've started talking to people about. The ethic of kicking a buck is basically assume that if you really like something, that you should seek out whatever it is they're asking you to do and do it. I don't love it when I listen to podcasts and they say, go give us a five-star review if you love our podcast. I don't, I don't love that. I'd rather there was something else to do. But if that's what they're asking me to do, I will try to do it. And if somebody is saying, kick in $5, here's our place where you can kick in $5. 
I will try to kick in $5. And the reason for that is when you are working with audiences, it does not have to be a huge audience before the scale of a tiny contribution from each person would be so different from zero. For my personal show, the difference between everybody who listens to it giving $1 a year and giving nothing would be massive in the fortunes of the show. A dollar a year. So when you go to something that you like and you like it, look for the opportunity to give them something. The ethic, the ethic of kicking a buck. Because if the people who are coming up now as new content creators and new content consumers can, as a group, broadly adopt the ethic of kicking a buck, they're going to be able to accomplish a lot of things that otherwise are not going to be possible. And along those same lines, develop relationships with audiences that assume, that, that, that don't train them to think of things as fundamentally free. Which is hard because training people, giving people things fundamentally free is often how you get them to try your thing, right? That's what we did. But there was a very good explanation of this. Um, the Maximum Fund Network that Jesse Thorne does that has um, Judge John Hodgman and Jordan Jesse Go and um, uh, My Brother, My Brother and Me and a lot of other really good shows. They have a fund drive every year. It's like a pledge drive for radio. But it's a time when they encourage everybody to become subscribers to Maximum Fun. And in one episode of Judge John Hodgman, Hodgman gave an explanation in which he basically said that he was glad that Max Fun had always encouraged people to think of themselves as subscribers and people who gave value. Because if you don't do that, and then all of a sudden you start asking them to give value, then you get people where that enthusiasm is busted and where you get resistance. And you can give away a show, you can give away a show, hypothetically, for free with no ads for four years. And then if you introduce a mid-roll spot that's like 15 seconds, you can get people saying, oh, I don't like this at all. I don't like this at all, what happened to my show? You can't blame them because they've been trained to think of it in a certain way. But of course, for me personally, when I hear mid-rolls on a show that I like for the first time, I think, woohoo! Right? Now they don't have to do it for free. Forever. So I think it's important to build those relationships with listeners and audiences and readers that encourage them to think of an exchange that's going to have to happen because people need to pay rent and eat. And although it would be very nice if everyone could do all of their work for free, that is, among other things, going to make content creation something that only very, very privileged people are capable of doing. So, so that, right? <laughs> That's a hard one. I don't love that one because I don't like asking people for money. Um, let people be wrong and still exist in the world. And this is, let, this is less a content thing and more a world social media thing. I feel like people who try to say anything interesting are turning into those drivers after car accidents who are afraid to apologize because their insurance company told them, if you apologize, you're admitting fault. So never say you're sorry. So you get heels dug in. I did not say a stupid thing. You misunderstood me. You took me out of context. I did not say a stupid thing. I did not, definitely did not say a problematic thing. I definitely did not say a thing that reflects stereotypes or even my own frustration that I expressed in a way that's hurtful to people. Definitely not that. It was a long time ago. It's very hard for people to apologize because it's very hard to apologize for doing a dumb thing and then getting on with your life, right? You don't have to like Katherine Heigl movies, but to me, the fact that people still ask her about something she said about Knocked Up in 2007 is ridiculous. Ridiculous. You're in an interview, you say, nah, I don't love that movie. I thought it was a little bit like, nah. And she's completely right. But that's in, that's in politic. You're, that's in politic. You're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to bite the hand that feeds you. That's, that's unprofessional. That's bad. Which is a fine thing to say at the time. But should we be having that conversation eight years later? I would argue no. <laughs> Just me. 
So here's my last world I want to live in thing. Be generous to people and you will never, 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 never be sorry. It is, like I said, I am a competitive, competitive little weirdo when it comes to my own work. I want people to listen to it a lot. I want them to tell me that they love it. Sometimes I want them to like it better than certain other things. <laughs> because I'm a competitive little weirdo. But if I am competing with a show, for example, another show, and they ask me to come on it, I will go on it 100 times out of 100. And I try very, very hard not to do the thing where you sit there and say, does this help them more or me more? You try to just go on people's shows, shout out people's stuff that you like, be an advocate for things that you compete with, be an advocate for things that are still developing, be an advocate for people that you know and people that you don't know and people who seek you out and ask you to try what they're doing. Because this is how fundamentally I meet people now is through, it's how I meet people in the context of work, is that people support each other's stuff. And when I, a few years ago, I was working, I still worked in a much more cramped room at NPR then. And there was a young woman whose name was Sarah Ventry, who was one of our interns. And I didn't really know her. She had a terrible day. She had an old job thing that kind of like reared up and something was going on. I really, really didn't know her. But she reminded me of myself very much in that she had a very loud laugh, which I also have. So I would sit there in the room thinking, that girl's got a loud laugh. <laughs> but I didn't really know her yet. But I saw that she was having a terrible day and I said, look, you don't really know me. Let's walk over to Starbucks. I'll walk you over to Starbucks. You gotta get away from your computer because now you're reading a bunch of comments about yourself and you don't wanna do that. So we walked over to Starbucks. She became one of my favorite people. I still know her. She just ran a women's rock camp in Arizona, which I think is pretty cool. She's wonderful. She works at KJZZ in Arizona. I'm a huge fan of her and I met her because I reached out to her and I'm so happy about that. And I have friends who are like young, independent podcasters who basically I met because I'm trying to suck out their youthful energy and appropriate it for myself. <laughs> it's kind of true. Uh, but they're wonderful and they're wonderful to talk to and it's different people and it's different people in my life. And this is the kind of thing like, I have no idea, like the future of content, it really is LOL, this shruggy guy. I don't, I don't, who knows? Nothing's, if we came back here in five years, I have no idea what any of you are gonna be doing or what I'm gonna be doing. But if it turns out that it's gonna be the wrong move to try to advocate for a bunch of other people's shows, I don't care. If it's gonna turn out to be like, you really should protect your own flank, you know? If that's gonna be the rule, I don't care because what's the point? Like in a world of total uncertainty, you might as well do the thing that you're going to feel good about. That is honestly how I feel. It, it, if there were rules to follow, I might be following them. But I have no idea what they are. So when in doubt, do the thing that you're going to feel good about because what kind of world do you wanna live in? And that's why I return to that over and over and over again. And absolutely not everything that I do is the right thing or contributes to the kind of world I wanna live in. And that's why I have to ask myself as frequently as possible and not just once. Because it's super, super difficult to live that way. It's kind of, it's kind of scary and unnerving. And that's why, I felt, like I said, I'm up here giving a speech about the future of content and two weeks ago I was saying to my friends, writing might be obsolete. <laughs> I don't know, but I feel really good about what I'm doing right now. And every day that I get out there and I get to share something that I'm super excited about, that I make with people that I love, that I make with people that I respect, and every day that you can put that out there, that's already a win, right? There's, there's a site that just recently shut down called The Dissolve. It was a wonderful site of film reviews, wonderful writers. And I'm friends with some of those guys. 
And when I talked to them after the site shut down, it was like, it's sad, but again, we got to do exactly what we wanted to do for two years. That's a chunk of your career, that's pretty good. So I feel, what I'm trying to protect is that I feel really good about what I'm doing right now. And that's the best insurance policy that I have against this total existential anxiety and nerve-wracking nature of the future of content. That's the, that's the protection I have against LOL Shruggy Guy, is that I feel really good about what I'm doing right now. And so my, my advice about the future of content, my prediction about the future of content, my hope about the future of content, is that the largest number of people trying to behave as if they're thinking about the kind of world they want to live in will ultimately be beneficial to everyone. And sometimes that's going to mean writing about a Jennifer Lopez movie trailer. I am proud of that post, <laughs> as far as it goes. And sometimes it's going to mean writing 11 parts about the state of television in 2015, which few people will read. But I will be really proud of and really happy about. So I encourage you to do the things that you're going to feel good about and that you're going to be proud of because nobody knows what's going to happen, so you might as well do what you're going to be glad you did. And that's what I would say. So I think we're going to have some Q&A, right, Dave? So yeah, there's a mic right there, which I'm going to make sure is turned on because that's always better. Check, check, check. OK. So uh, make a line right up here um, uh, if you want to ask questions. I'm going to set another mic up uh, here for the people in front. And uh, fire away. <clears throat> I was going to say, don't all get up at once. I can ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm new to this whole thing, so at the risk of making an uninformed question, I want to get back to something you talked about early. The first thing was about monetizing enthusiasm. I know there's a writer named Todd Gitlin who wrote a book called um, Media Unlimited, and it's a history of media, and his point is, is that it's an incremental step of emotional engagement. So as history has gone through, it demands more and more of us to become more and more engaged emotionally with, with the content. So as I'm listening to your, uh, to your comments, the thing that occurs to me is you talk about monet I wonder if you could talk a little bit about monetizing enthusiasm. Because if you're creating content, have you found yourself in a position where your sponsors are putting demands on this enthusiasm? And do you get granular about enthusiasm? Aside from, I think, Kick a Buck you mentioned, you talked about you know, certainly subscriptions. But in the process of being creative and content, is there like six steps of enthusiasm? Or does a sponsor come up to you and say, we need an extra two bits of enthusiasm <laughs> next week because we got to hit our, our numbers <laughs> because, hey, they're, they're looking for their quarterly results as well. So I wonder if you could just speak to that, that part of the business model aside from, you know, uh, yeah. how do you measure and how do you handle that? And how would you say that to people that are starting off with yeah. this? You know, to, you have to keep topping yourself with, <laughs> on that level. Thank right. you. Um, if there is a way to manipulate the level of enthusiasm in that way, I certainly don't know what it is. Um, I think that... Um, I think that the trick, the trick with enthusiastic people is that um, you want them, I mean, my goal with enthusiastic people is always to have them be as enthusiastic as possible. But then, but not, mm, my, <laughs> my friend Sarah Bunting, who was one of the people who worked at television without pity with me, used to refer to a phenomenon she called squeezing the kitten which was that you would have people who loved your work so much and were so excited about it that you would find yourself sort of saying like, pet the kitty nicely. <laughs> <laughs> because if you give a kid a cat and they really love the cat, pet the kitty nicely. So there can be sometimes kind of like too much closeness, I think. But in terms of sponsors, I think sponsors, I, I, I care, for me personally, I care a lot less. I don't think sponsors think about, we have to manipulate that level of enthusiasm. I think they're trying to gauge how much enthusiasm you already have. I don't think they're necessarily, I, I certainly don't know how to manipulate it or adjust it. I could probably figure out ways to make people less enthusiastic, but I don't know how to make them more enthusiastic. So. 
I won't squeeze the kitty, I promise. <laughs> um, but I am a huge fan, so thanks for coming. Awesome. Um, so I haven't really fully formed this question yet, and I probably should have, but you come from law. Yes. I work for the government. Yes, um, I did too. And so what I am struggling with working in something like new media for the government um, is encountering the conflict that exists between a linear right and wrong world and this plane that is creating things and thinking outside of the box and encountering an institution that doesn't necessarily jibe with the way that you work. So I wondered if you could muse a little bit about your transition and how your experiences in you know, government and law have impacted you and how the two conflict and intertwine. Um, that's a really interesting question. I think that um, <clears throat> the kind of lawyer that I was, I was an appellate lawyer, so I was always writing and basically arguing, which is like what I'm doing right now. So, uh, and in fact, my boss used to say to me, like, you don't care about law, you just like stories. <laughs> uh, you just like good stories. You don't care about law. Um, I think that one of the things that was really helpful for me was having kind of that in between stage because because in between law and NPR I was freelancing and I was working for kind of um, a, a very much an independent site um, and I think I learned a little bit how to navigate a more unstructured kind of environment and then wound up in NPR which is of course a really structured environment and I, I think mostly a really positive way and I actually now really prefer like, I like being at a place where there are some kind of, where there's a lot of editorial oversight about things because I like working with people who are going to be challenging and, you know, who have high standards. So in a way, I gravitated ultimately back to a world that has a lot of, a world that expects a lot of you in terms of being able to, to live up to what, what the standards and the rules are because um, that's how legacy media organizations are. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think <clears throat> I think law made me a person who who had some appreciation for um, for argument and for um, logic. And so my hope is that in what I do now, that I still bring some of that to to that work. And I had a network executive not long ago say to me, "It did not surprise me when I found out you were a lawyer," <laughs> which I chose to take as a compliment. <laughs> Even though you definitely wouldn't have to. So thank you for that. <clears throat> well, and we should talk later because I am also a former attorney who is now running for office, actually, as a way to sort of hack the system. So um, <laughs> so good luck there. But anyway, uh, my question is, how do you feel about things like Gimlet Media and a lot of folks sort of coming out of the NPR world and then sort of merging into a more, how do we monetize this and make it a more you know, wider accepted and uh, money-making enterprise? Um, I think that <clears throat> Gimlet specifically is such a cool experiment to me. I think that they are, um, I like the people so much and I like what they're doing so much and I completely understand why they decided that going outside of the radio, of kind of the world of, of radio was the way to go. Um, NPR is not a, it, it, its specialty is not those like long, long form storytelling kinds of things like they have on This American Life and stuff like that. So I understand wanting to do that. I think in terms of the economic models, it's just really early to tell. Um, I, happen to be a, I happen to be a subscriber to Gimlet because um, I love their shows and so according to the philosophy of whatever, um, I, I'm a subscriber to Gimlet. Um, I, I, I like their stuff. In terms of how I feel about it as an NPR person, uh, sad. And, and every time somebody leaves, we recently had Eric Newsom, who was our, our VP, um, went to Audible to, to head up some audio for them. 
And I'm super happy for Eric because he'll be great. But was I sad? I was very sad. And there are some people who, who have been at NPR who are going to go work with him there. So there is definitely like an anxiety around people leaving. But there's, there are also a lot of people who are coming in and all you can do is, you know, do the best you can. And, and, and again, try to have collaborative relationships with those people. Like I still have a relationship with Eric. I know the people at Gimlet a little. Um, so, you know, but is it, is it a little sad? It's a little sad. It's a little sad. So um, I have a question about live streaming. I feel like it's everywhere now. We had Meerkat and Periscope and now yeah. Lab. Um, and so how do you feel like live streaming is going to affect the content world? It's a great question. Live streaming makes me really nervous, just me as a person. Um, my first experience being live streamed was um, when our, our correspondent, Ari Shapiro, was in the office and Ari was doing like a Periscope thing. Meerkat at this whole time, by the way. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> so Ari came over and, um, and he had his little phone up and he was doing Periscope. And as he's walking over, he's like, is it okay if I put you on Periscope? And it was, no, 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 it was fine. It was fine. Like he was, he was, I was not on yet. It would have been fine. I would have said no. But I said yes and he came over and, um, and, and we chatted and it's unnerving. And I don't know why it's necessarily unnerving. Like you could theoretically be, you know, recorded or have your picture taken anywhere. Um, in terms of how it's going to affect content, I assume it is. I mean, I assume I assume that it's going to have a huge impact, but I, I just haven't, it, it's a terrible thing to say, but I haven't thought about it that much. It's not my, it's not my particular world. Um, I see it at NPR mostly as like supplemental stuff that they do for news. Like I believe Nina Totenberg did a, a live stream thing on the day of the gay marriage decision is my recollection. Um, so they use it for certain things in news. I'm not terribly experienced with it, to be honest. Hmm? We'll talk. It's sure. Fun, sure. <laughs> hello. Oh, hi. Hi, how you doing? Um, hello. I'm Nicole. Um, Nicole? So I've, I've tasted that pain of your, like, blurb of that J-Lo trailer. Like, oh, I've, yes. I've... I've Yes. Someone else tasted this. <laughs> I felt this. Yeah. Like I've been blogging and copywriting freelance for a couple years, and by far, like the most acknowledged thing I've ever ever done online was retweeting a picture of a baby goat. So what I'm wondering is we've all tasted we've all tasted that pain, <laughs> right? We've all tasted. But it's that like you pain. said, like you're. Uh, you can't look. Goats, goats are a special. Goats are a special thing. Goats are a special category. Goats and cats. Ask Taylor Swift. <laughs> the great things for goats. But like you said, you're like I'm a weird, competitive little person. But like writers are weird, mm -hmm. fragile little mm -hmm. people. Like we live and die by those stranger chortles, right? Sometimes. Yes. So the question is, does that ever? Do you ever hesitate, or would you hesitate again, to write, spend weeks on the 11 page, 11 series thing, to write like the big long thing that matters, when it's like, hashtag long read seven paragraphs, right. and when you know that like, right. you'll get all that, those strange old charters you just crave right. by crapping out something in 20 minutes? Um, would I hesitate to write it? No, because if I got to the point where I hesitated to write it, I would not need to be in my job anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but here's what I would have done. I would have done a better job of collaborating with people at NPR to figure out how to promote it and frame it so that people, more people might see it. Because it's not a binary, right? It's not, it's not there's nothing else I could have done or uh, I shouldn't have written it. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, I feel like in the case of that, I was so nervous that I didn't know how it would be received at the company because it was long. So I mostly just kind of wrote it myself and put it up. If I had it to do over again, I would go to the, to the visuals team and I would say, what could we do like as a page for this that would look great? Like what might be like a video component that we could add to this where I could talk to you about like summari summarizing it a little bit? Something that might get it seen more. Like I would work harder for my own writing. That's what I would do. I would work harder on its behalf and I would trust people to help me more, that's what I would do differently. But I would never not write it because I'm always going to want to sit down and write that stuff. It's just, that's just who I am, as you can tell. When I told my best friend that I had to come here and I was going to talk, I said, I said, I got to talk for 45 minutes and he goes, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a delightful sick burn. Okay, so we're almost out of time and I see there's three people
people out to make sure the three of you get in. So if you can keep the questions a little and short. And I will try to keep the answers short, too. Awesome. Is writing dead? In a world where major pundits are saying writing may be obsolete, I'm wondering how can writers become better moderators of a nonstop talk show, which the mass media has become a matrix of crisscrossing nonstop talk shows, and you're picking up tags and throwing things out like juggle, a juggling act. Just wondering your thoughts on that, how you're obviously adapting to this kind of world and still maintain your identity as a writer and your ability to think mm -hmm. in something right. beyond a few seconds. Sure. I'd like your comments on that. Sure. But I'm struggling with that. Sure. Um, I think that you, a little bit of it has to do with resetting your definition of what it means to succeed in writing. Because like I said, I think what I do have to get used to is not looking for that like gigantic traffic hit on something that's a long piece of writing because it's probably not going to happen. Unless you're like ta Coats, Coates, which I am not. Like ta Coats, Coates, which I am not a writer. He's a writer. Um, who does long writing that gets read by a lot of people. But not everybody is going to be that person. Um, I think the other thing is you just have to keep writing as well as you can. And like I was saying earlier, you can figure out how to market your writing better. And when I say market, I don't mean kind of like in a gross, greasy way. I mean in a way that gets it in front of as many people as possible so that as many people read it as possible, which I think is a perfectly valid and legitimate thing to want as a writer. So that's what I would say. Hi. Hey, so uh, you mentioned the dissolve yes. earlier. And um, their completely sudden shutdown earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, as somebody who writes primarily about film independently and tries to do long form stuff, it was really discouraging when the dissolve disbanded. It's a heartbreaker, isn't it? <laughs> almost, almost said it. Uh, We're all friends here. Earlier this week, uh, I was at another content meetup, and one of the points that was brought up was that. One of the strongest things a content creator can do is find a niche. Uh, the niches are in the riches was the actual phrase that was tossed out. And I've been kind of struggling all week with how much I actually believe that. Because I feel like if a site like The Dissolve, which was an extremely niche audience, mm -hmm. couldn't really or couldn't find their niche or couldn't find a niche big enough to support them, uh, I feel like it's almost better to have just a wide variety of topics to cover. So you're them. talking about like becoming a generalist. Versus generalist being versus a extremely yeah. niche. Well, I would encourage you to, to keep a couple things in mind. One of which is the, the, the shuttering of one specialty film site does not mean no specialty film site could ever succeed. And, the, and that fact is true regardless of the fact that I think those writers are as good as you're going to get in terms of writers. It has nothing to do with that. But there are a bunch of different models. Like they weren't doing subscriptions. They weren't asking for money. They, they ran it in a certain way. It was meant to be an ad supported site. It was run under Pitchfork. That's one way to do it. I have not concluded that there's no way to do that. I think it's just they gave it their best shot under the model that they chose. And now they're still all writing about film. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're all still writing for different outlets. I just saw them in Toronto. So um, so, I mean, I guess I would say, like, you know, it's, it's still a live question of, of, what, of whether niche sites are possible. Is it safer to be a generalist? Is it easier to get work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It is easier to get work. Perhaps that's a sad answer. <laughs> that microphone is substantially taller than you are. <laughs> so are most things. In yeah, the yeah so um, I'm, a, I'm, a sh I'm a shorter lady myself. So I, I am actually not a content person. I'm a marketing person. Okay. And so I, I also work for a pretty established nonprofit. And so what you said about sort of this um, tension between, you know, being nimble and having pop-up projects, but also having that sort of institutional perspective and resources um, really resonated with me. So my question to you is, as someone who finds herself in the position of sort of holding that stodgy institutional perspective, oddly, um, and someone who, whose responsibility it is to sort of... Um, to hold the line a little bit? Messaging and branding, yeah, and, and, yeah. and editorial standards. Yeah. Um, how can I help cultivate an environment where, you know, it, it's... Um, easy to collaborate with content creators and not mm -hmm. feel like we're 
at odds with one another. Yeah. I mean, I think there's always going to be some tension there. I think, I think that people who want to make whatever they want to make are always going to bump into a, a little bit of, of that inside of institutions. What I would, what I would say is um, meet and get to know the people who are making that content in situations that are not crisis situations. Um, get to know them and work with them so that you have a relationship with them so that they don't feel like every time they see your number on the phone, they are going, oh. Because there are people in every company where that's what it is. They only ever call you when somebody's upset with you. So the phone rings and you oh. So if you have that relationship with them so that you can like swing by and talk to them and say, hey, here's a thing. What can we do? Would this work better? You know, those kinds of things. I think it's much better than kind of staying out of it. Because some people want to just stay out of everybody's way until there's a problem. And I actually think that can be counterproductive because then you get that like push-pull kind of thing. So that's my advice. All right, it's 11. You guys have a ton of stuff to do. So.